Delighted to be here with uh, Professor Delong, Brad. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm gonna have the chance to to read this book, which I believe is uh, coming coming soon in Spanish edition. So, Brad, just to get yeah, us one started, more. one more week. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, again, I the book is a this a unique, wonderful um, economic history of the 20th century and. The book starts with a grand narrative, which follows through in the different chapters. So I was hoping you could start just by telling us a bit about the grand narrative, Brad. And if you don't mind, it would be great if you could tell us something about the, the dates you pick. You know, the book tells us why it's 1870, the starting point, and 2010. So go ahead. Well, let me start with 1870, you know, with 1870 as the hinge of history with British economist, moral philosopher, and polymath, you know, John Stuart Mill, writing just after 1870, that hitherto all the mechanical inventions yet made have just enabled a larger number of people you know, to live the same life of drudgery and imprisonment um, as they had before, but have not advanced living standards for anyone other than the elite, um, because humanity was under great Malthusian pressure. Um, that kind of one third of couples did not have surviving sons. And in a patriarchal world, if to not have a surviving son, especially if you are a widow, is very close to being social death. And so whenever there were extra resources, people would strain every effort to try to have more children so they would raise the chance of having a surviving son. And so say between the year Minus 1,000 and the year 1500, you know, technology advanced absolutely massively over that long period of time, but the human population grew from 50 million to 500 million, so that farm sizes were one-tenth as large in 1500 as they'd been in five minus 1,000, and so all the better agricultural technology did not raise nutritional standards. And the same was really almost true up until 1870. You know, that in 1870, your typical human being is still living on, you know, very close to what the World Bank would call dire poverty, um, something like $2.50 a day, spending half of their income and their resources simply getting 2,000 calories plus, a spe plus special nutrients a day, um, plus enough shelter that they weren't, you know, cold and enough clothing that they were not wet. Which means that governance before then, if anyone is going to have enough, it's because they become part of an elite who run a force and fraud domination game at the rest of humanity and take from the producers to give enough for themselves. So that's history up until 1870. After 1870, everything changes. Technological advance rockets forward. Humanity's technological competence at manipulating nature and also at organizing ourselves productively doubles every generation. In every generation, there's a new and much more productive economy. So it becomes very clear that pretty soon humanity will be able to bake a sufficiently large economic pie for everyone to have enough. And now we have wealth vastly beyond that, that any previous century would have seen as more than needed for everyone to have enough. You know, and then we should have been able to build a society that should look pretty utopian, that after all, there is no longer the necessity to dominate and oppress because there isn't enough for everyone so that you can have enough. And yet, even though we've successfully baked a sufficiently large economic pie, one that every previous century would have said is absolutely wondrous and wonderful, you know, they would look at us and they would say, you know, why is your society not working better? Why are so many people still unhappy? Why have you done such a lousy job at you know, slicing and tasting the economic pie? You know, why have you failed to equitably distribute it? And why have you failed to use it wisely and well? Um, so that people feel safe and secure and are healthy and happy. Um, and that story of how we became very rich by pre previous perspective from 1870 to 2010, and yet we're unable to properly distribute and utilize our wealth. 
you know, that that's the big story of the long 20th century and practically everything that happens fits into that story. And so I try to fit all of history, world history from 1870 into that particular grand narrative with I think considerable success and some failure. Uh, definitely a lot of success. So, Brad, let me start with you at the beginning. Um, you know, I, I very much enjoy the first chapters of the book, and mm -hmm. I feel like there are kind of three themes that come there. The first chapter is really about globalization and, and trade. The second chapter is really about technology and creative destruction in some sense. And the mm -hmm. third one has democracy and sort of political economies when they start to show up. And I feel like these three themes come over and over uh, throughout the book in, in different ways. So I was hoping if you could expand on, on, on all of these, do you think they're the, sort of necessary for, you know, slouching towards utopia? What do you think, you talk a little bit about, about technology and sort of that was the driver for why you picked 1870, but how about globalization and, and so that is the... Globalization means that there really is only one big story after 1870. You know, it is not like before, when different countries, different regions evolve, not totally in isolation, but events happening on other continents have only you know, minimal impact on what's going on in your own society. You know? um, and that's not true after 1870, right? Uh, the Society of Brazil, say was completely upended at the end of the 1800s as you know, British agriculturalists took rubber plants from Brazil and grew them in hothouses in Kew Gardens in London and then moved, transplanted them to Malaysia where British capital, British merchants, British machines and Chinese workers together planted the rubber plants there and harvested them and made rubber plantations three times as productive as those in Brazil because all the pests and parasites of the rubber plant were kind of left behind in Brazil. And also Chinese workers expected only half as large a salary as Brazilian workers did. And so Brazil's major export industry, its entire rubber sector, something that looked to be excellently positioned to make Brazil kind of the Saudi Arabia of the 1890s because electricity needed rubber and internal combustion engines needed rubber. All of that blew away because of something happening 10,000 miles away and the decision of financiers around the world that the world no longer needed the Brazilian rubber industry because it had a better one available you know, in Malaysia and elsewhere. Um, so that's what globalization does. Um, then there's the, right, that the technological cornucopia is created by the fact that we have in the background, with the background we have modern science and you know, the empirical turn and the experimental turn, but that doesn't do much or that doesn't do enough until after 1870 when we get the industrial research laboratory, which rationalizes and routinizes and so revolutionizes the discovery and development of new technologies. You know, but even that wouldn't have been enough. But, but we also get the modern corporation, which takes the products of the industrial research laboratory and then can develop and deploy them worldwide. You know, not just in one workshop or in one factory, but in factories built in every major consumer and city area around the world. And in the context of the global economy, which makes the profits from successfully deploying new technology so enormous, and also creates the world of communication and transport in which it's quick and easy to see what people are doing technologically in other parts of the world and bring them there. You know, those are the things that mean that every generation we have a new economy, which means that for the first time in the history, it's you are unlikely, you know, you are very unlikely to be doing the job that your grandfather or your grandmother did because things will have changed sufficiently and those jobs simply no longer exist. And this every generation, we have a new economy. And so every generation we need to kind of rewrite the 
social, cultural, economic, political software code, you know, how we interact and how we do things um, in order to deal with the fact that we now have a totally different underlying, you know, technological and machines economy. Doing that on the fly, you know, doing that every generation is more than humanity can collectively manage to do without the whole thing going crash. You know, and the whole thing goes crash many times in many places in small scale in a province or a country or in large scale or the world as a whole. You know, and each time it goes crash, we try to pick ourselves up and figure out how to move forward. Um, because we do have immense, immense productivity vastly exceeding that of all previous civilizations. You know, and yet getting our act together to kind of peacefully and cooperatively use this um, proves remarkably different, right? Um, you know, and right now, for example, you know, um, if I had been sitting in Moscow's Kremlin and if I had said it's really important to convince the Ukrainians that they are not a separate nation, but you know, rather a mere an ethnicity of Russia. Um, I would I would spend money um, establishing tour companies of the Bolshoi Ballet, and send the ballet on tours of Ukraine. And I would hire poets to read the works of Pushkin in public squares of Ukraine. You know, I would not send in the tanks and the killer robots. Um, and yet. You know, we have a world of we have a world of tanks and we have a world of killer robots, um, and do you know it's on one level it's extremely distressing, um, and the book ends on a relatively depressing note because you know the argument from 1870 to 2010 was that technology had kept pushing our wealth forward extremely rapidly. Um, but that dealing with the consequences of, you know, societal revolution over and over again was just a little bit beyond us. Um, but looking forward, you know, there are lots of economists who say that the pace of wealth growth is slowing down. And there are many more who say, I think accurately, that most of the potential increase in wealth we get over the next two generations will have to be spent dealing with and neutralizing the costs of global warming because we are very late to dealing with this problem. And so for the next two generations, we are going to continue to have socio-cultural, political, economic you know, upset, but we are unlikely to have you know, the increase in wealth that makes people think it may all be worthwhile and that helps, you know, that helps reach arrangements. You know, it's much easier to reach arrangements when there is extra wealth to be distributed rather than when there is, when some have to win and some have to lose. All right, so, you know, you say the book ends not in the highest note, but this is a very optimistic book, I think. The, yes, the yes. grand narrative is extremely optimistic. It's very positive. It always is the, the glass sort of half full although it talks about why it's not completely full and why we're not in utopia yet. It's, you, look, do, I, you deeply believe on the, on the positive narrative of the 20th century? Yeah, my, great, my great grandmother, my great grandmother, Eleanor Lawton Carter Lord, who I met in I was a very small child in the early 1960s. Yeah, a woman born in 1877, a fairly rich woman. She was in the first class to graduate from Radcliffe College, um, Harvard's you know, Women's College in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, you know, she asked my mother um, if my mother had lost any teeth while carrying me, you know, because she came from a world in which it was assumed that everyone was so calcium deprived that even upper class women, you know, would lose a tooth or two. So while carrying a baby as the calcium to make the baby's bones were kind of leached out of the mother's body. You know, she came from a world where one in seven um, mothers died in childbirth. And I think she had five siblings, no, four siblings, but of the five of them, two died before the age of five. You know, and, you know, watching half your babies die and mm -hmm. seeing one in seven women die in childbed and, you know, 
having many days when you spend two or three hours thinking you're incredibly hungry and would really, really like to have more calories, but cannot because you have no money, um, no resources, no harvest left over, and you don't dare eat the seed corn. You know, that was the typical human experience you know, from the invention of agriculture in minus 8,000 on up until 1870. You know, and that's not the typical experience for anyone today in terms of public health. And it's only the typical experience of, say, the 400 million of our 8 billion who do live in dire poverty today. And the fact they do live in dire poverty is you know, a scandal, an atrocity, a disgrace. But still, it's only 1 20th of the world population rather than the bulk of it. Now, the book is, is clear about that. So um, I think that the book makes, if you have, makes clear there are kind of four, four stages in the 20th century. We've talked a little bit about the 1870, 1914 piece. And then right. um, there's after World War II, 1945 to 19. Uh, 75, which I believe you call the 30 glorious years. I, I, I'd like to ask you about this in a second. And then you have this neoliberal turn at the end, which I don't think is so well treated mm -hmm. in, 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 in the book. But there is the interwar period there, which I was hoping to ask you a bit, because that seems like a bit of a stop on, on the process. Those 30 years are really, um, you know, they don't see the same progress. And you value, I mean, you discuss whether it's a failure of the market on the one hand, if it's a failure of the government. Can you mm -hmm. give us kind of this, your synthesis there? Why there is this 30, 30 year stop and we, can we avoid something like that happening to us in the future? Well, you know, one way to view it is that you had, you know, a, that say you had a feudal society in Western Europe, at least around the year a thousand, you know, and by, 1700, you know, technology had advanced, et cetera, et cetera. Things had moved on. You know, you had a commercial imperial society, you know, that, you know, um, that it's no longer the case that governments have to rely only on people who have sworn oaths to them in order to assemble their soldiers or their sailors to do anything, you know, that... Isabella of Castile can take money taxed from the great sheep guilds of, you know, the, of the Mesta and use it to hire a navigator from Genoa and then Portuguese expertise in building ships that they've gained from their expedition down, um, recruit a bunch of Hidalgos who are now unemployed now that Granada has been captured um, and send them off to the West. Um, to see what can be found, because maybe Columbus Christopher Colon is right, and the world is only two-thirds the size that the Jesuits um, say it is. Um, he was wrong, but there was this whole extra continent in the way, um, which is not something that any previous European ruler could have done, um, because you had to pick up people and skills from six or seven different places. Um, rather than rely on your feudal hierarchy right, of those to whom you have given land and who owed you fealty and service. You know? And so the commercial society is a very different one. And we evolve um, absolutist government, a bureaucracy, a market economy, an idea that people are independent producers and you know, that they are in the business of working and finding counterparties. Um, and there's 700 years to adjust to this shift and the adjustment does not go peacefully or smoothly at all, but you know, there is an adjustment. Um, and that creates kind of the ideas usually called of classical liberalism, right? that feudal survivals in the government are by and large obstacles to progress, that we by and large need a smaller state, that we need to liberate commerce, that we need to let people you know, find their occupations and do their own things. And then we need to move on from the absolutist governments to a very limited government because security of property is very important. You know, and that's kind of the orientation with which Western Europe at least enters the 1870 to 1914 period after the coming of the Industrial Research Lab of the Modern Corporation. And after 1870, it goes absolutely great. You know, economic El Dorado. Um, John Maynard right. Keynes like to say, 
two generations during which there is more advance in human well-being and human living standards than you know, ever before. Um, and yet that particular you know, economic political system inherited from the commercial imperial society, it fits less and less well as 1914 approaches and people react in all kinds of ways. Um, one way people react is that, you know, the landlord bureaucrat soldiers of Eastern Germany, you know, suddenly find themselves in huge trouble with, as the rye that they usually, that they've been used to selling to the merchants and workers of Hamburg suddenly is undercut by 50% by wheat coming in from America, from Argentina and from Russia. And so they begin to think that the world market and that world change is their enemy. And that the solution for this is for Germany to become a large and powerful enough country that it can dominate the world economy rather than being a subject you know, to the world market. And lo and behold, it becomes German policy to take all of France's coal and iron ore and to demonstrate that the French, that they're no longer the most powerful nation in Europe than to turn Russia into their India um, to colonize and exploit. Um, and so what had been a 50 years during which wars had been small, especially been great powers, and the focus had been on advance, it turns into a situation in which politicians say, now is our struggle for national survival because durable national prosperity requires a more important political place. Um, and things fall apart. And after 1919, people try to put them back together again and singularly, singularly fail. Um, why the failure was so great, you know, is still- You talk about, sorry, but you talk about the lack of hegemon there. I, I, that's an, yes. I think you bring it back to Kindleberger and this connects with this it is. sort of it is. It is. North Atlantic it is. view a bit on, on dominance yeah. over this whole century. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, my teacher, Charlie Kindleberger did indeed think that everything could have been cobbled together if only you had had what you had before 1914 and also after 1945, you know, a single dominant power that understood that managing the world economy was its business because it was so large that no one else could possibly do it. But after 1918, you know, Britain no longer has the power to manage the world economy and the United States doesn't have the inclination or, and may well not have had the power until World War II. Um, and so attempts to get the economy back together so you can resume progress, you know, simply do not work, you know, do not work at all. And without, you still have all the, you know, um, the technology is still changing underneath. So you still have all of the turmoil and disruption you know, but you don't have the growing wealth, and so people get extremely, extremely angry. You know, um, and so people go fascist, um, people go communist, um, people go nationalist, above else people go nationalist. Uh, people go ultra Catholic and say we have to swear allegiance to the Pope because he is only our true God. People go atheist. Um, Lots and lots of different movements, all of them saying we have to reform our society absolutely, absolutely massively. And we have to do it according to this plan right now, you know, because letting the market economy govern us no longer works. And maybe it never worked. You know, maybe it always was just a mirage. Um, that's what you have from 19... 19, 1914 on. Um, and then I think we are very lucky in 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt becomes president of the United States you know, and is extraordinarily pragmatic, does not see himself as a left-wing or a right-wing politician, but rather we have to do something. So he tries everything. Um, if you can get into his office with a plausible idea, you will leave his office with an agency and a budget <laughs> and with permission to try to do something. Um, 
Do you think you have to break up the big utility monopolies? Yes. Um, do you think you have to spend money in order to pump the prime the pump to get the economy moving again in a Keynesian way? Yes. Do you think you have to establish corporatist organizations of your know, industrial self-regulation? Yes. Um, do you think you have to provide national pension insurance? You know, yes. And Roosevelt tries everything and reinforces what succeeds. And by the by the time he dies in the middle of World War II, there is kind of you know, a plan, right? Which is a largely market economy coupled with a substantial social insurance state backed up by a fairly, fairly high and progressive tax system and with a large government role for building infrastructure and funding research and development and guiding technological progress forward, what historian Gary Gersel calls the New Deal order. And that seems to work excellently for the 30 years after World War II. Um, where it is in large part imposed on because the condition for receiving Marshall Plan aid was pretty much that you fall in line with this system in one way or another. And the United States then was a hegemon very much interested in maintaining full employment and rapid growth worldwide, not just because it thought it needed that in order to win the Cold War in order to make sure that if the Cold War did turn hot, the fighting would be in Germany rather than in the United States. Um, and that looks, looks to me, even in retrospect, looks like an absolutely wonderful time in which we almost got it right. Um, so if you had to pick one of the four periods, you would pick the 30 yeah. various years? Yes, yes. Um, but, you know, my friend Yingyi Qian says this is simply because I'm a social democrat who's never given up the idea, the dream, um, that the New Deal order, social democracy, went smash in the late 1970s you know, for powerful reasons, that it did fail its sustainability test. And that in any event, right now, you know, we do not have the mass production, high wage, blue collar, easy to unionize industries on a large scale and do not have the, you know, um, manufacture, important manufacturing industries with huge economies of scale that we had in the first post-World War II generation. We have a very different economy. We have an economy that's moving from a global value chain configuration into an info biotech configuration. And social democracy, the New Deal order, really did require the mass production configuration underneath them for it to be stable and for it to make sense. Um, so trying to rebuild what is now two generations gone is you know, as vain an attempt as were those in the mid-1920s who tried to rebuild the classical liberal framework that they'd inherited from commercial imperial society. Uh, yeah, no, I, I see that. I mean... The last part of the neoliberal turn that, that you, I think you, you call, it's um, quite interesting. I believe you were part of, for example, the Clinton administration, which was a yes. 10 years of like eight years of like tremendous growth. Yes. And I, yes. I will rank them pretty, pretty much at the same level as those 30 glorious years. But it had a very different flavor in a sense, because it was a bit of a social democracy was being left behind in, in a sense. And something else was, um, was coming. But, you know, I was thinking like thought we were, we thought we were obvious that we want to go back to, oh, sorry. Yeah, we thought we were social democratic wolves in neoliberal sheep's clothing, um, but okay. go on. <laughs> no, I was just saying like, if there's a clear winner between social democracy and neoliberal system, I mean, you, you already said that you deeply believe in the social, social democrat uh, version of it. I'm just trying to make the point that there was some really powerful growth I mean, in the neo, in the neoliberal uh, order, and mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if you think it's uh, it's obvious we should go back to, or, or like you know, if the way to go is really to go back to yeah. the um, social democrat system, or there's a way to tweak this neoliberal order in the sense in which we live right now. To well, I definitely do not think we can go back. We do not have the man large manufacturing industries. We do not have the unions. We don't have the ease of organization. Um, you know, we also do not have 
I mean, the social connection, um, you know, like for example, last Thursday, you know, high tech financier, Peter Tile, his founders funds, you know, the other barons of Silicon Valley, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, um, the Silicon Valley bank, rapidly growing bank with $160 billion of assets or so, you know, it's undercapitalized to say the least. Mm -hmm. That is, it has a mark-to-market -market loss on its government and mortgage-backed security bond portfolio, which is much larger than it should have had. And yes, if you take a comprehensive view of SVB's balance sheet last Thursday, it does have a large anticipated capital gain from the bonds that it's planning to hold to maturity. Because if anything is certain in this fallen sublunary sphere, it is that... Um, <laughs> the treasury bonds are going to be at par when they mature. And so they are temporarily embarrassed. You know, they are not insolvent. They are especially not insolvent from a view that is willing to be patient and to put a low price on risk. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, if we had what, this bank term financing facility that the Federal Reserve put into place on Sunday, yeah, yeah. by which mm -hmm. Silicon Valley Bank could have taken its treasury bonds and run to the Fed and said, give us cash at par for mm -hmm. these, then we don't care how many withdrawals there had been from Silicon Valley Bank in Thursday and Friday. Um, right. It could have paid out them all and then turned around and looked at people and said, please bring your deposits back now. We've done you good service here, see? We actually paid out everything. Um, and you know, you would have expected the barons of Silicon Valley who have been in very close working relationships with Silicon Valley Bank for 40 years now from which both have benefited enormously. You know, um, to say that, well, wait a minute, um, the US government is not in the business of letting bank depositors lose their money. You know, Silicon Valley Bank is you know, in a delicate financial position, but you know, we think it's okay in the long run. And we have massive amounts of capital, right? That we would be willing to buy up some Silicon Valley Bank shares or to backstop some if things became necessary, because this is a valuable part of our community. And we think our communities are tremendously, tremendously productive. You know, um, it's just sit tight, do your jobs. You have better things to do. Um, the US government is on the case and it's not in the business of letting people, depositors lose their money. And we're here and we're in the business of supporting the community and Silicon Valley Bank, and we are immensely wealthy. You know, but that's not what they said. Um, they said, run for the hills. Um, and, you know, because Peter yeah. Tile and company said, run for the hills. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, by Monday morning, they looked like panicky idiots um, because the deposits were all there. Um, they also annoyed Janet Yellen and Jay Powell and the FDIC chair and all of their staffs because they had to work over the weekend. And while it is somewhat <laughs> exciting, um, it's you really would rather not have to do that over the weekend. Um, and, you know, they've demonstrated to everyone who's a potential counterparty that there's someone who's not in it for the long run. But if they see a chance to rescue some money for themselves at the expense of counterparties, you know, that they will do so. Um, and, you know, that's an interesting lesson about a... Um, an economic system that does not have the believed community of interests, does not have what an you know, earlier generation of us, people like us would have called social solidarity, does uh -huh. not have what the Arab historian Ibn Khaldun called Isaba Asabaya, um, that does not have that in order to be a effective cooperative division of labor moving forward, rather than a place where everyone looks at each other suspiciously as if I cannot trust you to fulfill your contracts unless they're really, really, really nailed down. Um, and I think that kind of erosion of social trust is what I guess Nathan Nunn would call it, is 
a reason to fear for the future and mm -hmm. a worry that the neoliberal era has in fact taught those kinds of values to too many people. You know, that we need to have very hard incentives because the moochers and the grifters are out to grab whatever they can from us and we mm -hmm. need to hold on to our wallets very tightly. I, I see the danger, I see the danger there. There's one, another thing I wanted to ask you, Brad, which is like, there are these thinkers that come up, uh, you know, in uh, different places yeah. in, in the book. Yeah. I think Hayek versus Polanyi is a bit of a dialectic battle yeah. that's being fought for the book. Mm -hmm. And also Keynes seems to be like the the right synthesis. Of, is that a, the right way to read the, the book? Or? It's, it's, he had... You know, that you have Hayek in one corner saying we, that bureaucracies are inefficient, you know, and central planning systems are worse. And that what we actually need to do is we need to crowdsource solutions to human problems. You know, we need to get all of humanity's brains working on solving a problem. And the best way to do that is to tune market prices so that they are in accord with you know, social utility, um, with general utility you know, to do Pigouvian taxes and so forth. So the market has the right prices and then establish property and contract and give things owners so that decisions about what to do are made by people out at the periphery of society who actually have information and because they have property, they can control resources, they can actually take action without having to get approval from some bureaucrat at the center who has no idea of what is going on. Um, and they're also incentivized to take action because as long as prices are in accord with social utility, you know, what is good for society makes you an awful lot of money. You know, so that the market economy is perhaps the ultimate crowdsourcing device for turning all human brains into the business of advancing human well-being. And it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we definitely need it. But as Hayek says, it's not fair, right? It gives to people who are in the right time at the right place and who are lucky massively and doesn't give much to others. You know, but Hayek says we need to forget about the fact that it's not fair because if we start trying to monkey it, we'll break it. Karl Polanyi, on the other hand, says, wait a minute, you know, the market economy is a very stark utopia. You know, the only people it sees are the wealthy because they're the only ones who can demand anything, who can offer to pay for anything. And thus the only rights it recognizes are property rights. You know, but people will simply not stand for a society in which the only rights that are vindicated are property rights. They will insist on something else. So try to push the market too far and you will create an explosion on the other side. Yeah. And it's not that Polanyi is terribly certain what the right distribution and allocation of rights is. Um, other than he wishes he could be some a market socialist of some kind or other and wishes that the market economy were properly embedded in a society in which people cared and had concern you know, for each other. Um, in which people had, in which you had the benefits of crowdsourcing that the market economy gets. But you also get you know, concern for people's having the status they deserve, concern for continuity of enterprise, concern for stability um, of community and location. But mostly Polanyi is simply their warning saying we really can't push the market any further and wherever we push the market too far, society will break it. And then we'll have to pick up the pieces and try, try again. And indeed most of the political economy, most of the process by which people try to rework you know, the institutional framework of exchange and relationships in order to deal with changing technology can be put in terms of this you know, push and pull between Polanyi and Hayek. I mean, John Maynard Keynes, I see John Maynard Keynes as mostly off to the side of whimpering, saying, if only you would let my students manage aggregate demand properly, you know, we could actually get you something close to full employment all the time and also get you a pretty good distribution of income 
because full employment monetary policies will drive interest and profit rates low. You know, and so the super rich will only be able to exercise social power by spending down their capital, and then they'll cease to be objects of concern. You know, that, that grave worries about income distribution and about economic crisis are only if you don't listen to me. And if you did listen to me, we would be pretty close to you, Tony. And I oscillate between thinking that Keynes was right, that Keynes was mostly right, um, that he was substantially wrong because low interest rates over the past 15 years do not seem to have been accompanied by low profit rates for reasons I do not understand, that a time of very low interest rates has been a time of expanding income and wealth inequality, which Keynes definitely did not expect. Um, and then there is the position, the Jacob Viner position, um, that Keynesianism essentially requires that people have expectations of stability that it undermines, which is the problem of the Federal Reserve today, right? Um, how fast does it dare try to push recovery from the plague depression before it undermines the expectations that it's relying on for price stability in the long run? And the Federal Reserve's decision problem has just gotten a lot harder in the past week. It has, yeah, yeah. Interesting, yes. Yeah, so I I guess the fourth person that shows up is Schumpeter, right? And I guess we talked yeah, about the- yeah, yeah, this is something that makes me very sad and very sorry, right? That, okay. Um, yeah. You know, that my publisher, Basic, is in the business of publishing a 300-page, you know, book to be read on airplanes by kind of normal people. <laughs> And, you know, I gave them a 600 page book, which is two steps more, two steps more for professors and such than I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. So ordinary person. And it's twice the length and that they published it rather than telling me to go away and find a university press um, that they published it. I am extremely, extremely grateful. Um, but it did mean that lots of pieces were left on the cutting room floor. Um, and the pieces I most regret are the Schumpeter pieces, you know, about how we have these 20 key industrial moments in the 20th century. And I only kept two, one about Nikola Tesla and electricity and the other mm -hmm. about Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation and Moore's Law. You know, I have critics yelling at me about why isn't there anything about oil where there should be and mm -hmm. on the cutting room floor. And in addition to the 20, this industry was a very important growth pole and it mattered a lot, um, little segments. You know, there also is the, well, we went from the feudal to the commercial imperial society economy, but then in 1870, we had the steam power economy. And that was different from the 1910, you know, internal combustion engine, chemicals, electricity economy, which is different from the 1950 mass production economy, which is profoundly different from the 1990 global value chain economy. And now here we are headed for the info biotech economy. Um, you know, those things. I want to write that book. Um, right. I want to write that book, you know, much more the book that Joseph Schumpeter would approve of, a book that's kind of halfway between the book I did write and the book that Vaclav Smil um, would have written. Um, so maybe I will. Maybe I will. I do have a lot of pieces on the cutting room floor after all. Happy, happy to read it, Brad. Uh, you know, we're getting close to the end. And uh, you know, since you're talking about technology, um, yeah. There's all these new um, AI push, you know, yeah. chat GPT. Yeah. Yes. Do you think that looks like one of those 20 events that are going to you know, push us towards utopia faster? Or or you think that could lead us it's sort of the, the wrong much... way? Like the coming of the personal computer, right? Um, which quintupled white collar productivity, but also quintupled kind of the general mess of stuff you had to deal with. Um, 
you know, that, you know, the coming of the personal computer, which you know, made individuals infinitely more productive in terms of their ability to produce prose and images and videos and you know, greatly benefited humanity provided you could manage to sift through what now was an embarrassment of riches. It was a big moment. And the coming of the internet, right? The massive interconnectedness of things. And this world in which everyone has a smartphone that they spend most of their time, you know, um, walking around hunched over it, engaging in the kind of long distance communication with their friends and their social network all the time, you know, that used to be confined to teenage girls who were hogging the telephone right, in the 1970s and 1980s and the age where the stereotype was that the teenage girl would spend two and a half hours a night on the telephone gossiping with all her friends about what had happened during the day. Um, that the conversion of that, um, those are wonderful things. And yes, generative I don't want to call it artificial intelligence because it really isn't. You know, Cory Doctorow proposes the acronym <laughs> SLAMI instead, which stands for something. Um, but what it really is, it is, it is autocomplete. It is autocomplete for desired images, is it autocomplete for paragraphs? You know, that you feed chat GPT a paragraph. What it does, it is it goes out to the internet. It looks through all the paragraphs on the internet, finds the nearest neighbors to the paragraph you submitted it, and then it averages the answers to that paragraph that it finds in its training data set, and it spits back the average. And, you know, that's not, it's not alive. It's not thinking. It's just auto-completing. It's just auto-completing at this very sophisticated paragraph level scale. Um, and... It's wonderful, right? It can autocomplete, the, the stable diffusion can autocomplete a description of the image into what the image is probably like. Um, Chat GPT can autocomplete a desire for a syllabus about economic history into a two paragraph syllabus on economic history. And, you know, it's, it's pretty good to the extent that the information on the internet, you know, is pretty good. Um, it's far from perfect, right? Um, it thought that Easter was April 9th uh, yesterday. <laughs> and I said, wait, that's not right. Um, but it's wonderful. And you know, precisely because it will allow, it will auto-complete, it will allow you most of the time to have instantly at your fingertips, what was the next paragraph of thoughts you were going to have, that the process will be of correcting the autocomplete to what you really meant, um, which is five times as fast as writing the whole thing out by yourself. You know, unless you're an extraordinarily creative thinker whose ideas are not found on the internet, that's what it will do. And that will be a wonderful thing. Um, for all of us who are in the business of writing or drawing or doing videos or anything else. Um, but these views that we need to start asking it at the end and please don't kill all the humans, right? And please don't attempt to get world domination. That seems to me to be vastly overblown. Interesting. Um, it's simply taking the corpus of human knowledge on the internet and you know, averaging it in some sense. Um, from what paragraphs usually follow other paragraphs. Ted Chiang had a very nice piece on it calling, it's called it a blurry JPEG um, type thing. You know, it's, you can see where it's getting the information from, but it's not there yet. Interesting. Well, on that note, Brad, I think we are, we are oh, hitting thank our, you very much. our Thank you very, hour. very much for the interview. I wanted to thank you for taking the time. Also on behalf of the Fundación Rafael del Pino, of course, we're delighted that you spent time uh, with yes. us, I, I speak as, a, as an alum, and yeah, I, I can only say it's a wonderful book. Thank you for writing it, and thank, thank you for you. taking the time. Sure, it is my pleasure. Thank you, Brian. All right. Yep. Goodbye.